Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Innovation Evangelist podcast. My name is Tom Raftery, and uh, this is the continuation of an old podcast series, the IoT Hero series, which I've uh, rebranded as the Innovation Evangelist podcast and moved to a different domain, innovationevangelistpodcast.com. Thank you for joining. Uh, with me on the show today, I have Kevin. Kevin, would you like to introduce yourself? Good morning, Tom. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin O'Donovan. I'm the founder of a boutique technology consultancy company, and I spend my time focused on the intersection of new technologies in the energy industry. So I do a lot around helping companies understand what's going on with technologies and I suppose bridging the gap between some of the, let's say, marketing hype that you hear and, and what actually works or what's coming down the line and what you need to worry about. Nice, nice. And Kevin, you and I have known each other for a number of years because uh, we've both been uh, in and around the energy space for a long time. Uh, give us a little bit about your background first. So I've spent my entire career, I suppose, evangelizing about new technologies. Uh, I'm an electronic engineer out of the University of Limerick way back in the 90s. So that kind of 1990, I came out, so that kind of dates me. Um, and I, I worked with Compaq, uh, HP, and most recently with Intel in technical sales roles uh, at European and, and worldwide level. So basically working with customers with, with new technologies down through the years on how they would start deploying them. And it's uh, it's back about, uh, what, 2007 and eight, when I was with Intel as part of our, our worldwide uh, strategic planning team, we started looking at new business opportunities and the energy industry started popping up. Now at the time, it was all about being green and mm -hmm. whatever green meant, <laughs> but we were looking at it and we kind of were, there's there's gotta be new business in here for Intel at the time in terms of, well, everything's being, you know, digitization, I don't think was a word then. Neither was IoT. Uh, yeah. It was all embedded and adding compute and stuff. Yeah, so we you started. Don't, you don't typically think of uh, Intel in the energy space. No, you agreed. And now back then, Intel was looking at all the various, let's say, what you now call the verticals, the industries, as well. They're the consumers of the technology. So what are their business problems? What are they trying to fix? Or what's happening in their world? Um, so that's the way we approached it. And we started working with the, some of the large oil and gas companies and the, 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 the big utilities across the globe. And obviously all the, their suppliers, so the usual suspects in terms of the, the HPs and the Dells and the Acers, but also folks like Siemens and GE and lots of smaller innovation companies that were looking at putting more technology into that industry. So, you know, smart meters was the big one in 2008. And we yeah. go, oh, we can put a chip into every smart meter. and There'll be billions of them and <laughs> woohoo. Um, we quickly figured out that, you know, smart meters are smart, but they're not that smart um, <laughs> in, in terms of compute technology and then. Sure. But you started looking at it from a business development point of view, saying, well, if people start deploying millions of smart meters, they're going to generate a lot of data. So there's a lot of communications infrastructure. The guys out installing them will need laptops and mobile phones and whatever. They'll be consuming more technology and all the data goes back to what we now call the cloud and it's going to get processed so someone's going to be buying data center servers um so that's kind of the way we approached it so anyway so i i i i i, I was then asked in about 2010 to to help develop and set up a entire sales organization for intel into the the energy sector so we did that with a gang of us and i was with intel up to about a year and a half ago um where uh, they asked me to relocate back to Munich and we decided to stay where we are. We're here in the south of France, not a bad spot to live. <laughs> um, and I've, I've decided to let's say, set up my own little um, booty consultancy company focused on the energy sector because I find what's going on in I energy is a critic, you know, it, 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 energy as an industry, as a need is not going away. Yeah. But the amount of transformation, innovation, hassle, fatigue, chaos that's going on there, I, I, I just found fascinating. So I, I've stayed in that, that industry. Great. And I mean, it's an industry which, um, you know, one wouldn't normally have associated with innovation, I, I, I have to think. In, I think, like 50, 60, 80 years, uh, up until, say, 10 years ago, there was very, very little innovation or the innovation that did happen happened at a very slow pace. Whereas in the last 10 years, it's been almost turned on its head. That's true. 
I, I suppose I'd answer two ways. Um, certainly for the amount of, let's say, innovation or innovation that's being forced on the energy industry in the past 10 years has has just uh, accelerated, skyrocketed. Um, yeah. You know, if you look at the energy industry 10 years ago, it was pretty, yeah, it was very stable, for want of one word. Yeah. Um, and it was very siloed. You had generation and transmission and distribution and, yeah, things, you know, it was a kind of a culture of if it works, don't fix it. <laughs> and suddenly everything else happened and there was a lot of blurring in between, well, what's generation you know what's tesla is tesla a car company or an energy company yeah. um oh what's happening you know look what look what happened with uber and airbnb can can someone do the same to us um and in renewables and electric vehicles whatever so it, it the pace of change just in society and technology that impacts into the energy industry has just been you know phenomenal so dealing with that and we'll chat about that yeah but the one thing the one thing i would i would you know it, down through the years as we've been working with energy companies, um, certainly utilities and energy companies didn't do themselves a lot of favors because they didn't really engage with the general public in terms of explaining what they did. Yeah. Um, yeah. So people kind of just... The way I talk about that is I say, in any human relationship, uh, you know, between two people, it's only through communication through talking to each other that you build a friendship and you build trust. So if you have an organization uh, who's trying to build a relationship with its customers, if the only communications it puts out, it, it, it puts out are bills and disconnect warnings, yeah. it's not a real way of building trust or a relationship. Well, it, it, you can see where you kind of dig a hole for yourself, right? And, and it was back in, like say, 2007 and eight when we started digging into well what are they actually doing so you sit down with the likes of eon and edf and duke energy and state grid in china and they start explaining to you well this is what we do and you go holy mackerel it's like god just it's the most complex real-time system on the planet you know <laughs> what do you what do you mean if a generator starts going wobbly at one end of europe in in almost real-time synchronous that frequency dist uh, distortion goes all the way to Portugal. Mm. How, do you, how do you deal with that? Oh, well, we have all these systems and we've automated this and it's not connected, everything's not connected, but we have all these things and you're like, Good, holy, wow, I had no idea you had this level of complexity in the system and, yeah. and the lights stay on. <laughs> if, you, if you look at, you know, what do you call it? Bef uh, not long before IoT was a thing, um, the likes of Siemens, GE, and whatever were automating power stations and the technology that goes into them. If you look at the the innovations that, okay, drilling for oil and gas may not be as cool as it was before, but if you look at the the high performance computing and the the, the modeling of reservoirs with high performance computing and their ability to direct drill heads under the ground in all sorts of directions. I mean, it was fascinating to figure out that, God, there was a lot of stuff going on here, but you never told to anyone. Or, and they were kind of going, well, nobody asked and nobody cared. <laughs> right? yeah. Within their world, they had it. And then they couldn't understand why people were saying, you don't do any innovation and whatever. Um, now, that is still a, a challenge. And, and we'll chat about it here in terms of if you look at the, the innovation that's going on, one of the, the opportunities and challenges is the the innovation around changing the culture in these companies. And what I mean by that is for many valid reasons, if you're a utility and you're supplying energy to a country, a city, a community, you're under huge obligations to make sure the lights stay on. And if you don't, there's hell to pay, right? Politics, financial yeah. fines, you name it. Yeah. God, look at what's happening with PG&E in the US right now, right? It's horrible, yeah. Um, and yet you have the, let's say, the new world of innovation and it's like, oh, look at all this cool technology. We can do this and let's try this. And if it doesn't work, we'll just iterate and we'll try it again and keep going and we'll just roll out something. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, we'll fix it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the guy in the control room is going, you're not touching my stuff. <laughs> right? So what do you mean? We're, we, you know, if it's working for 10 years and it doesn't, then you can prove it hasn't, there's no, there's no update. And we're not going to update anything, right? So we just roll it out once and leave it there. Yeah. Um, that cultural 
challenge. And, and now that's being forced to change because I know a topic close to your heart is people are plugging, you're, you're plugging in an EV. Yes. The local distribution operator is going, uh oh, okay. Well, if, if only, you know, 10 or 15 of them get plugged in grand. But what happens when, what happens when lots of people plug these things in? Oh, God, we have to start changing how we do things. Um, so I think that's where innovation is being driven. So, yes, there's a lot to do. But utilities and energy companies, they've done a lot behind the scenes. They don't get the credit for it. And, yeah, they have, they have a lot. They, there's a long way to go. But I, I think the, the challenge with most of them right now is there are so many things we can change. We only have so much resources, so much skills, so much money. What are the ones we'll do first um, and, and what makes sense? Yeah, it's it, 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 it's a really interesting topic because you've got if you look at the uh, the economics, the, the supply and the demand, uh, or looking at it from an economics framework, you've got the supply side and the demand side, and both are changing. On the supply side, the traditional utilities had like big central thermal plants uh, pushing out electricity at a constant rate, and on the demand side, you had consumers who you know plugged in their toaster or their coffee machine or whatever, whenever they wanted, or they turned on their TV and turned it off whenever they wanted. And overall, when you aggregated the demand, it was variable but predictable. Yeah. And when you looked at the supply, it was completely manageable. Whereas we're moving to a world where the supply is now shifting to largely renewables, uh, in, in Germany, I think now renewables have surpassed coal for the first time and become the largest generator. It's up, up at around 40%, I think I read recently. And, you know, mm-hmm. that that's not, Germany isn't by, by any means unusual in that. I think it's gone above 20% in the US for the first time as well. Mm-hmm. So renewables are starting to become a serious player. And the renewables, by their nature, particularly the wind and solars, are variable and not manageable the way the thermal plants are. And then on the supply side, we're starting to get people do things like you rightly said, I bought an electric car recently. So my consumption is going to increase. But at the same time, it's now a manageable consumption. There's smarts built into the car and built into the charger that I have here at home uh, that can decide when to charge the car. Now, this is very basic smarts right now, but these are going to improve over time the way smarts always do. In, in my case, we have a rate here from our local supplier. We have a green energy supplier called Feni Energia, and they give us a tariff that if we consume electricity between 10 o'clock at night and noon the following day, our electricity price is nine cents per kilowatt hour, which is lovely and cheap. Mm-hmm. And then after 12, from 12 to 10 o'clock the next evening, it's 17 cents, uh, nearly 18 cents per kilowatt hour. So there's a big difference between the two. So obviously, uh, it makes a lot more sense to consume electricity between 10 o'clock at night and noon the following day. So I have a timer built into the car, and I plug in the car at 7 o'clock in the evening, but it doesn't start charging until 10 past 10. I give it 10 minutes just to just make sure everyone's on board. So the, the, the car starts charging itself at 10 past 10. And because it's only got a 40 kilowatt hour battery, it means, and it's a three kilowatt charger, it means by about, you know, depending on how much driving I've done, I don't plug it in every night, but it means by, you know, about midnight or one or two in the morning, it's fully mm-hmm. charged and that's it. It's yeah. Done. You know, it stops charging then, obviously. So it's, it, so it's supply and demand are both changing. The demand is now becoming more manageable whereas it was the supply in the past that was manageable. So we're now moving to demand-side management because, you know, we're getting more smarts on the uh, on the demand side than the supply side. No, I agreed. Uh, and as you say, it, it was very much a top-down model. Uh, and again, when, when I started digging into the industry, whatever, 10 years ago, you'd start understanding that, well, we have a, a, a... We can plan our almost a year ahead in terms of how much capacity we need because we have modeled the supply of everything for the past X amount of years. Yep. Not down at the, not the, as you say, not down at the the micro level as per house or whatever, but per feeder line. And you're kind of, you, you start figuring out that, oh, wow, they have some incredibly complex algorithms and they're factoring in weather and whether there's a, a rugby match and everyone's going to plug in the kettle at half time. You know, they had some yep. really complex stuff. So there was a lot of innovation going on there. But as you say, 
the renewables and people building wind turbines and putting solar on their roofs that really changed things now also th- like turning off all of the nuclear fleet in germany and stuff that had huge huge yeah, yeah. Huge, huge drivers and i suppose the way i look at that innovation is that so you have innovation coming out of new technologies so what we now call iot or you have new software architectures like blockchain for new way of designing applications in a distributed ledger way mm-hmm. you have uh, new comms coming down the line. So we've got 4G today. You've got, you know, narrowband IoT, yada, 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 5G coming. So you had all of these technologies. And a lot of the time, certainly from an IT sales perspective, we were out there going, here's a great technology. What problem does it solve? We're not sure, but it's great. Yeah. <laughs> and you needed a business driver for someone to say, well, why would I invest? I, yeah, I, c- I could do all this, but what's the re- why would I need to? Or what's the business opportunity? And some people took a risk and said, we think this is the way it's headed, so we go off and do it. Others, ah, I'll just wait and see. It's like cloud, right? Why would I go to cloud? I, I don't need it. Um, and then suddenly people started plugging in renewables, and it's like, oh, God, I have to manage the, the, the transmission grids because, I, as you say, the, the flow of electricity changed completely, right? So yeah. there's people feed stuff in. It's not a tops down. I do think that the biggest driver of, let's say, innovation over the next 12 months is the electric vehicles and, and cars, buses, whatever, people plugging more. They're, they're relatively bigger loads. Um, so I've got to manage that at the distribution grid. Yeah. And to be quite honest, yeah, th- there's still, you know, techno- there's a lot of technology there. And when 5G eventually does roll out, won't it be better for comms? Yeah, and this and that and the other. But a lot of the technology we've had for a couple of years will now start to get deployed, you know, at European Utility Week in November uh, in, in Vienna. My kind of key takeaway was people that I know for years, there was this kind of sense of, it was just like, oh, do you know what? We just have to get on with it. We've been talking about it and we've had pilots and we've had PowerPoints for years and yeah, yeah, yeah. But now folks like Tom are plugging in an electric car. I have to deal with it Yeah. because I have to. So now it's, I got to go do something. Um. So, it, so the innovation it, it's it's a growing issue as well the the amount yeah, the amount I of it. The, the amount of cars the amount of electric vehicles sold in 2017 was about 1% uh, of of new car sales in 2018 it was well over 2 nearly 3% so you can see it's at that hockey stick level now this year is going to be a huge year and next year is going to be even bigger again and when you're talking at 2 to 3% of car sales that's one thing, but the amount of fully electric buses that were sold in Europe in 2018 was about 9% of new bus sales. So it's not just cars, it's, it's buses, it's increasingly going to be trucks as well. Daimler are rolling out electric trucks as well as Tesla and Renault are announcing ones as well and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's, so everything is starting to go electric. So the demand for electricity, which has been plateauing for the last number of years, as devices have become more energy efficient, uh, utilities have seen plateauing demand for their product. And in fact, utilities, bizarrely, are trying to tell people to use less of their product. It's the only industry I'm aware of where the, the, <laughs> the manufacturer says, please don't use our stuff so much. You know, it's, 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 it's weird, but you can, you can see why. But now they're going to start to see a ramp up in demand for their product as, as, the, amount, as the demand for oil and gas dips. No, I, I agreed. And, you know, related to this, one of the other, let's say, innovations around technology in, in the energy sector is around energy storage. Yeah. And, you know, Hence years ago. electric cars. Exactly. Well, you know, is an electric car, is it a transport or is it a battery on wheels? Mm-hmm. Right. So it's it's energy storage. But you're also getting into the concept of, well, because I don't have these big thermal power plants anymore spinning away and maintaining grid stability, I need to start putting grid stability down at the distribution level. So this is for things like, you know, ultra capacitors are not new, but the way they're being used for frequency control, that's innovation or it's, you know, you can, you can have a long discussion about is innovation all about new stuff or is it just <laughs> finding new ways of using old stuff, right? Sure, sure. Um, but you see ultra capacitors, you see, Okay, you think energy storage and you think uh, oh, lithium-ion batteries. Well, mm. I, I had the opportunity to attend the, the European 
um, Energy Storage Association's event a couple of months back. There's zinc. You know, the, the, advan- the innovation around chemistry, around energy storage technologies, people using bromine for flow batteries, yeah. uh, zinc air, lithium and all sorts of other compounds. Um, obviously, you, you still have a lot of pumped hydro. Yep. And, you know, last year I had the opportunity to visit Fridays 2 down in Portugal where they're, it's a variable pumped hydro plant. So they can vary the amount of water they either push up the hill so they can generate a load to create some of the spinning uh, stability. Or obviously they can control the amount of water they let flow down depending yep. on how much they want to generate. Nice. Um, a lot of stuff going on there. You have people looking at putting... Uh, liquefied air, compressed air, people pumping air into concrete silos under the water and then letting the pressure of water press everything out and generate it. So there's all sorts of innovation going around energy storage. And, yeah. and again, that's being driven by, I got to I gotta keep the stability and the grid. And as more Toms plug in electric vehicles and there's more solar, I don't have those spinning motors because the laws of physics haven't changed that's the one thing that i think um is different with the energy industry and when we talk about digital disruption and you know oh look there's going to be an uber or an airbnb come into energy and and completely disrupt them yes it will but you're still moving electrons around so the laws of physics haven't changed there yeah um and 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 then you get into the whole as I say, the spinning reserve and the flex, uh, the frequency stability. Um, so that's where that's where there's there is a lot of innovation going on as well. So that that's uh, you know there's new materials. There's folks now putting in um, super um, uh, superconducting technologies into uh, wind turbines. It reduces the size of the wind turbine. The, the 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 magnets are being made you know about a third smaller. Wow. That makes them smaller, cheaper. Sure. Uh, new materials in 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 the actual wind turbine blades again through chemistry, so they're lighter, they they're more resilient, they don't crack as you know this kind of stuff. So innovation is it, it's fascinating. It's hard to keep up, I'll tell you. Right, right. So, I mean, speaking of of storage and, and cars, uh, we've been talking for a long time about uh, vehicle to grid as a as a concept. Uh, do you ever see that coming to fruition? I, I do, but it's I think it's going to take a while. One, my personal perspective, you know, if you look at the the EU's energy union strategy, mm-hmm. it is to enable, if you almost like a, 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 a an open market for energy. And I have a solar panel on my roof here with about well, ten years, and I live up the coast from you and in France. You're down in Spain. Theoretically. In the future, I could sell my energy to you to charge your car, and Tom, I'll give you a good deal. And <laughs> wh- whatever, right? Excellent. <laughs> and then it'll be all blockchain, and we're all happy. Um, but this is where the laws of physics kind of come back and bite you, because, well, you still need to get the electrons down to Tom. And actually, the electrons that turn up in Tom's battery may not be my electrons, right? That, yeah. it, that it just didn't work like that. Um, so there, there, there is a lot of complexity in enabling that at, let's say, a European-wide. What I do see happening is, and, and certainly the ability that it, as you're driving your car around in your region, you might, you know, when you plug in at the, you said you take your kids to school, you can plug in at the, whatever, a local coffee shop or whatever, you can charge your car, but who's to say in the future you won't be actually supplying energy to the car, into the grid? Yeah. Um and I do believe that will be managed by the likes of, of your local utility or, or somebody, an energy service provider, we need the escrows and all these kind of stuff. Somebody will do that in coordination with the grid because what they can't do, and this is where I have some interesting debates with companies that are doing a lot of the blockchain peer to peer. You cannot, you, you can't forget about the laws of physics. Um, we do not live on a, on a, on a, in a country where there's a copper plate connecting everything and electrons can flow in any direction at the same time. Um, you get grid congestion, right? There's, it all goes down a wire, so the wire will melt or whatever. Um, so, so you have to take that into consideration. So I do think that Tom will be driving around and depending on what the grid needs and the operator of the grid goes, I've got surplus or this 
I've got surplus right now or I've got uh, uh, I need energy being fed in to meet the demand. Tom's car will get a message and say, hey, how are you fixed? Do you want to charge now or do you want to do you want to give me some energy? That can all be done with a, a smart contract, which is a blockchain piece of software. Mm-hmm. Um, and you may have walked out, got up in the morning and said, hey, Alexa, maximize my energy consumption today in the car and it'll go off and do it all for you. So I do think that will happen, but it's going to take a couple of years. Some of the legislation still is not there, right? So I, I, I regardless of how cool the software and blockchain and yeah, yeah, yeah is, I, I can't sell electricity to you in, 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 in Spain, right? It's illegal. Yeah, right. Um, so, but, but I do think, and, and you're seeing it already, uh, you know, it, it's almost like, do you remember the way you'd go around to a, whatever, an SO station or a shell station, you'd have your, your, your fuel card. Oh yeah. Why, why, why won't you have a fuel card for want of a better word for your car and, and your car will decide. And Hey, when it's autonomous in, in four or five years time and it's driving itself, it'll probably make all the decisions for you. Right? Yeah. And the, the, there's going to have to be a number of, a number of changes, I think, because obviously the car can't buy or sell electricity by itself unless it's actually plugged in. Correct. Um, so, and most electric vehicles are only plugged in at night time when electricity is cheap and when they actually need a charge. So I maybe plug mine in once or twice a week. So uh-huh. one, one or two nights out of seven nights, it's plugged in and only for nighttime. So, you know, they're not con- con- connected all the time. However, there's a lot of moves to inductive charging. Yeah. And when inductive chargers are rolled out they, and they, they become more normal, uh, then people will just, you know, if they have a driveway, pull into the driveway, park the car over the inductive charger or have the car park itself over the inductive charger as, as it will increasingly be. And then it's connected all the time. And then it starts to become a more realistic pro- proposition. Agreed. And, and then the utility or whoever is, let's say, managing that will have real time view as to, well, how many cars are sitting over one of these chargers? What's the charge in every car? Because now, obviously, you'll have to agree to allow them get that data, right? Because you get yeah. back to the whole uh, GP, GDPR and privacy, blah, blah. But you, you, you'll get a better price. So you'll probably say tech, yes. Um, so to your point, then suddenly the whole demand and the balancing of the grid, they have a, a you know, in the ideal world, they have a split second view to say, well, there's a, a thousand cars sitting on top of inductive. I can charge 20 percent of them. I can take energy out of another 30 percent and the world's a happy place. Yeah. Um, so so I, that, I can that see, will happen. I can see those those inductive chargers being rolled out at, at city level. Uh, and then whether it's the city itself that rolls them out or whether it's a private organization that rolls them out, they suddenly become a virtual power plant. I, I, you know, agreed. I, I've sat in some, let's say, uh, brainstorming sessions where people are saying, do you know what? We'll, we'll, we'll allow you free parking in our garage because we will have inductive charging, but then we want to get access to your energy. Yeah. Um, and we obviously, they're not going to drain your battery. So when you come back, it's, <laughs> you can't go home. Um, but, it, but you can see that the, the innovation around business models there, I wouldn't say is endless, but you can come up with all sorts of things. But the, le- the legislation has to be there. And as good as the technology is, and you can do a lot of this stuff today, it will just have to become reliable. And people will have to trust it. Um, that's, that's Speak, the other speaking thing. of trust, because you, you mentioned a few minutes ago blockchain as well. And that's what blockchain is all about. It's, it's all about building an internet of trust. Um, I saw a story about, uh, I think it was Iberdrola here in Spain uh, this week, announced that they were uh, conducting a, they were using blockchain uh, to certify uh, renewable energy that they, were, that they were purchasing from producers and selling to commercial buyers who wanted certified renewable energy and they were using blockchain to certify that the energy is actually renewable and here look we can demonstrate it that kind of thing that's That's the thing that's real world that's real world and it's one of the first real world commercial examples of blockchain i've seen mentioned anywhere and it happens to be i think a really interesting use case because like you said about selling your electrons from your solar panel in France to me in Spain and the whole issue about the electrons not and the, the laws of physics not changing. It is people, there is a demand increasingly, there is a demand from consumers and from even, even more so from large organizations for 100% green energy. Um, 
so this this is one fantastic use case for our blockchain in in, in energy uh, and the the they the used open source technologies to do it they use the uh, energy web foundation software to do it yep um so you know there's very little stopping other utilities from from rolling this out that's one fantastic use case. The other interesting use case that people talk about are the likes of what you mentioned to me, selling the power from your roof, the kind of peer-to-peer -peer stuff. Will that happen, the, the, the peer-to-peer stuff? Will that happen? I mean, we're, we, we've already seen that Iberdrola has done the, the big one for uh, you know, selling, com selling commercial and certifying commercial green energy. So that has happened and will become more of a thing, I have to think. But the peer-to-peer -peer stuff is, is a more out there one. Will that ever become a thing? I, I think it will, but it is out there. And, and you know, back to your, um, so I've been involved with blockchain companies for the past probably two or three years. And, you know, last year, this time last year, the two of us could have written a white paper and created an ICO and <laughs> tried to make billions, right? And, and there was a lot of them. And, and yeah. some of them were, were interesting and some of them were less interesting. But that were, <laughs> um, now that hype has all kind of died down because of the whole cryptocurrency uh, fun and games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's not going to go away. Um, I, 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 I'm a strong believer in blockchain. Blockchain is a new architecture, network, paradigm, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, what, what, it what I say to people is it, it's, it's like a platform. It's like the internet. Exactly. So you have the internet. It's, it's a platform and people build things on top of it like the web, like email, like et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Blockchain is the same. It's a platform and people can build things on it like Bitcoin, but also like the kind of thing that uh, Iberdrola announced this week. Exactly. And, and if you look at where most of the traction around blockchain solutions are right now across all industries, it's in the financials and it's in supply chain management. How do, how do I guarantee this product and how do I put it? Now, if you look at the, the whole renewable energy uh, certificates, it's kind of like a trading platform. So a lot of that is kind of going, well, the banks are using stuff to trade and it reduces cost and whatever. So that's a real thing. Um, there are companies like um, PowerLedger, Electron, uh, WePower. You know, WePower started playing, they used a set of data from smart meter data that they were given. The country of Estonia basically gave them the sandbox of a copy of their data to go, how would, it, how would one of these things work? Right. So I do believe we will end up in a situation where I will, in my home, have some simple way. Maybe it's true voice. So I simply do a voice command to Alexa or Google or whatever my smart home, whatever kind of home I have. And I go... Uh, I don't know, I'll maximize my energy or, or sell as much as I can. I need more money to go on holidays next month or whatever. And there will be technology in the home which will automatically manage my the electric car in terms of when will I charge it, when will I discharge it, um, will I will I turn on my heating for is it cheaper now to run the heating or whatever. That can all happen in what they call the, through the smart contract. Smart contract's a piece of software, right? It's an agent that runs on a device to do something. Yeah. So, so that all, all that technology can be done. The technology exists. Yeah. Now, I do believe that we'll start connecting. So my house will start talking to my local energy provider and your house will start talking to your energy provider. If we're in the same community, I do see, you know, what do you call it, a microgrid or a community grid or a municipality or whatever. I think that's where that's going to start because I see the grid in the future of being a, a grid of grids. So villages, towns, communities will start to, let's say, have their own little microgrid or whatever you want to call it. Blockchain has the potential to be, if you like, the architecture that that's the platform that's built on. That's where um, Energy Web Foundation and many others are kind of heading towards yep. um no you can have an argument that you don't have to use blockchain you can use let's say traditional software you know the apis in the web and cloud and yeah 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 right but now you have you know that whole thing is blurring as well a, uh, amazon have a blockchain service on the cloud right so you know it's it again it's it's, it's all munging together yep. um, but i do believe that yes you will have peer-to-peer -peer, um Communities will will do it. Villages will do it. That will then connect up to the distribution grid. If the village has a surplus of energy, it'll 
feed it back into the grid. If it has a deficit, it'll pull it off the grid. It'll do all of the, let's say, the local billing and all this kind of stuff. I don't see that happening anytime soon for, as I say, me selling you electricity across Europe, right? It's just too complicated. Um, No, that said, who knows? But I I see it building up. The the, the laws, the regulations have to change, you know, because today if I want to sell you energy, I have to set myself up as an energy provider. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of lawyers and a lot of prep work. (laughs) Yeah. Seriously, gosh, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm not going to be doing it to sell you five euros worth of electricity. It, you know, I, that's why you have virtual power plants. Um, but the, the concept of virtual power plants, so the, the aggregate, whatever you want to call it, I, I do think energy unions moving that way, it, it, it's going to happen. But um, it, it's just, it's going to take a while. But, you know, chatting with utilities, chatting whatever, every utility, every energy company, they've got people playing with blockchain because if you're a software developer today and you're not looking at blockchain as an architecture you know you're 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 missing the bus right yeah um it's one of these things it may not become prime time in your industry right now but it's you know web tree that always around the corner right so it's it's just a piece of that yeah 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 absolutely we're at uh, 36 minutes i think it is here on the on the clock so i i think we better wrap up um kevin one last question um What's the most exciting thing that you see in the energy space in the next five to 10 years? Most exciting thing, God, there's a lot. Um, the one thing that I, I, I find fascinating right now is the whole trend towards um, a digital twin forward or a 3D model of, of your entire energy company, your entire utility, your entire city. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I've worked with drone companies and whatever for the last couple of years and people are capturing all this data and then they're building 3D models and you look at what Bentley systems are doing and a lot of these uh, CAD systems where I can build a 3D model. And then you start looking at what all the autonomous vehicle guys are doing. So they're capturing all of this data and they need real time maps at, you know, millimeter level almost driving around. You then have all the stuff that's going on with uh, people launching uh, low orbit satellites, Mm -hmm. uh, high altitude drones that are always on station watching for power lines and whatever. So you suddenly have all of this data. So how do you integrate all of this stuff so that as, as workers are walking around with heads up display or a body camera, they're capturing data and it's all being pulled. So this entire kind of real time digital twin of the real world now, it's a bit scary at times, but at the same time, you're like, oh, wow. You know, you start doing predictive maintenance because some guy walked past a piece of equipment and AI. Now, AI is one of the most misused terms of today. Yeah. Um, but but uh, but this is where I, I, I see, uh, you know, you call it the, the autonomous things flying around, walking around, driving around, crawling around, augmented reality, virtual reality. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you call it? AI, machine learning, yada, yada. They start coming together to provide this kind of digital twin. And then that opens up all sorts of other possibilities. So that that's kind of that big picture thing I'm watching. That That's that's fascinating. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Awesome. Kevin, that's been great. Thanks a million for, uh, for talking to us today and coming on the show. Thank you, Tom. And uh, safe travels over the next couple of months. And I'm sure I'll, we'll be meet up somewhere soon.